this is a great honor for me. Um, well, for a couple of reasons. One, years ago, I pitched at this event. Uh, I can tell you, actually, I did raise money because Catherine and I met at this event. Um, but I was going to say, I was a hopeless failure. Um, but I, I was going to start off by saying there is, there is a bias. There is a, at least, a, well, there's several, I guess, relative other investors that have put money into Canvas. And I'll try not to put that bias into play, other than to say, Catherine, you are looking lovely today. Yes, <laughs> are you. Um, but I, and, and I'll, I'll try to stay away from the boring questions, and, and I will stop early and, and let you guys grill the, uh, grill the investor so uh, you get to hear you, have your voice. Um, so most part, sounds like some early invest, earlier investments happening here. We're not talking B and C rounds typically, I'm guessing, from, from what I've um, read and seen. Um, as the earlier you invest, the risk goes up. Um, there's going to be a greater percentage of these opportunities that, that aren't successful. How do you mitigate risk uh, knowing that you know, there's a good percentage of what you put money into is going to going to not make you money. Can we start? Yes, please. Okay. I'm a little intimidated with the Renaissance man next to <laughs> I'll do my best. Good morning, everybody. I'm Todd Klein of Swan and Legend Ventures. Um, we do do very early stage investing as well as later stage investing, sort of what they call a barbell strategy. So to your specific question, um, one risk mitigated, of course, from a fund management point of view, is having some later stage investments in the portfolio. But specific to the early stage um, risk mitigations that we try and do uh, is, one, we focus on true domain experts, right? People who are, who know their field better than everybody else. So, you know, these folks tend to be the kind of folks that can pivot quickly when things aren't working and are, can adjust to changes. So we, we, we um, we think about things that way. Um, the other thing I would say, though, in terms of risk mitigation, the reality is if you're going to play in early stage investing, you're going to have wipeouts. And so part of it is spreading your bets widely enough to where sometimes it doesn't work out, sometimes it does, and the ones that win, win big. So the winning big is the really important part from, a, from the standpoint of making the fund. So part of this is making sure that the markets you're chasing are substantial enough that if you do win, um, it could cover the mistakes and the things that didn't work out. Julia Taxon, I'm with uh, Grow Tech Ventures uh, here right across the street. So we are uh, Series A investors. Um, typically, we, we do do earlier stage than, than Series A. And when we do, it's because we know and are comfortable with the management team. Um, so we're betting on the jockey a lot of the time when it's very early, and it's uh, if it's early stage uh, pre-product or um, or early product, early early uh, early revenue, it's focused on the uh, the CEO. So for us, we get to know the companies very early um, over time, and we do a lot of background checking. Um, we like to do market checks, obviously, to make sure potential customers could be buying the product. Um, you know, if they don't have the product yet in market. So for us, it's really de-risking on the CEO and the management team itself. Dan? So it's, it's a risky asset class, uh, but that doesn't mean you don't spend a lot of time trying to de-risk the investment. And, uh, and so uh, very often, you, you know, if, hopefully, in many cases, uh, even though we're angels, if people think angels are you know, the first money in the door three and a half seconds after the idea, that's mostly not the case. Uh, so we are thinking about things like cost of acquisition and lifetime customer value and, uh, and uh, trying to create a mosaic of uh, evidence that there's something real here. Uh, sometimes uh, we, of course, do invest prior to that, but then again, it's mostly going to be uh, the vision and the entrepreneur, and in most cases, that entrepreneur will have some kind of track record uh, that uh, de-risks the opportunity. So, uh, so again, risky asset class, but that doesn't mean that we are particularly re risk-seeking individuals. And I'm Dan Mendes from Action Angels. I'm Catherine Stewart from Cranberg Capital, an angel in the early stage investing, and I think I agree with all of what the panelists have said. But one thing that we really focus a lot on, beside the management team, which is which is so important, is also the potential market size. Because the potential market size can, if it's a large market that's quantifiable, where there's many applications and this product can go in many verticals, so 
sound familiar, James? Um, that at that point, you can end up, it's forgiving of mistakes, right? Because it is such a risky asset class that if the market size is large, the first derivative of that is revenue, the second derivative of that is, is net income. So it can be more forgiving. And also we look for, I mean, obviously we do look for the team that they've somehow have domain expertise where they've had in the past. So we, we've heard, obviously, CEO, the management team, a big idea. Um, knowing that, and usually it's the CEO or very senior people who are pitching you early on, what are the biggest mistakes you see just repeated over and over again where you're slapping your head going, no, no, you're blowing it? What's the biggest mistakes you're seeing from those people as they're pitching to you their, their game-changing ideas? There's a couple things I would note. Um, one people will come in and pitch to us who don't know anything about what we do, our specific focus. So they don't know sort of what industries we like, they don't know what stage we invest in. I have had people come in and ask me for working capital loans before. So it's as important um, to understand the venture firm that you're gonna go pitch to or the angel group or what have you, um, as it is to understand what you, you know when you prepare to go pitch a customer. So that's certainly a surefire way to sort of not be respected when you don't really know who you're talking to, and it happens far more frequently than you might expect. Um, the second thing that will definitely get us to pass quickly is sometimes people will come in and they say, we don't have any competition. We hear that a lot, actually. And it's either because they don't know the market well enough and understand that there probably are adjacent competitors, or they're just not telling us because they don't want us to know, or the market is so small, they're, tr they're right, and nobody's interested in it. And so those are all three bad. Um, but we actually, you know, you hear it more than, uh, more than you might imagine. And there are a couple others, but I'll let my fellow panelists go. I was going to say competition is this number one thing. People come in, and they show us their competition slide in the market, and they're all the way up, you know, to, to the right. Yeah, up, up, well, depending, yeah, either up to the right or up to the left, depending on the, the, uh, the matrix. Um, so really understanding that we, that's the first thing what we're likely going to dig into is the competition, what's out there, um, differentiating, differentiating yourself from your competition is, I would say, the number one thing um, that companies come in and, and really whiff on. Ditto. <laughs> Ditto on that, but also I think sometimes what happens is that they, they don't also recognize that what they're mentioning is, you'll try to say, why, why is it different? And they'll say, well, our product has this feature that no one else has. And in the meantime, there'll be a huge company that's already gone public that, and you'll just try, and they're so passionate about it because somebody has said, show a lot of passion when you go show, talk to investors. And they just keep on talking about this feature. And you want to very politely say, I understand, but there's already existing companies that are doing extremely well and you're just not differentiated enough. I, I would add to that um, uh, a couple of things, too. That I think entrepreneurs are very passionate about the stuff they're building and forget sometimes the audience they're pitching to. So to, to Catherine's point, you're, you're not pitching a customer. You're not pitching a partner that's going to be reselling your product. You're pitching someone who, you know, as coldly as this sounds, wants to make money on the money they're going to give you. Um, and, and so you, you've got to keep conscious to the, always, every, everywhere, everywhere you're pitching, you know, the audience. Um, that's what we've always found. Um, Can I make one more point on that? Sure. Just, just as just as a piece of advice, um, one of the things that we do a lot is try to understand your business model very, very carefully. I would strongly recommend when you go to pitch an investor that you understand their business model very, very carefully. We have a very specific business model. We raise funds for a certain period of time. We have a certain period of time we have to deploy it. We have to get it back. And if, if you don't know the business model of your investor, sometimes their business model can become yours. So it's really important to understand that. That's a good, good point. Um, so let, let's come up with some more uh, interesting questions. So each one of you have probably had a deal that you felt really good about. You may become p personally passionate about it. You're, you're getting really close to closing and or, you know, you're, you're down, you've invested your own time and then the thing goes sideways. The, the CEO, the company just makes a, a fatal mistake after you've already, probably even emotionally, you've gotten, you've gone pretty far. G give us a couple of examples. You can leave out the names of companies. Um, 
But it'd be great to hear some real world examples of how people have busted it, even you know after they've done a good job on the first pitch and you know they've gone down the path. Maybe we'll start with Catherine this time. That way. I think the number one thing is is when you start negotiating the terms, the person's personality has a tendency to be revealing, and sometimes you work with someone and you get really close to signing a deal and then something happens and you step back and you say I'm an invent I'm an angel investor this is a really risky asset class and the probability of all this actually failing is relatively high and not only that because I'm such an early stage investor I'm going to be spending another 7 years with this person right and when they're revealing during the term some characteristics that just are not that attractive you kind of step back and you go, you know what? Life's too short. Yeah, I, th I think that phase is the hardest part when you already have negotiated the terms and you're doing sort of the, the, um, the diligence between uh, term sheet and close. And as an investor, you start to become a little nervous about something. And it could be the team, and it could be the market, and it could be the product. Um, uh, and, and now what do you do? Um, as an as an investor, where you you might actually still like the company, but maybe at a lower price than what you originally invested in, that's a really hard conversation. Um, so some people have it, some people step away, some pe some people uh, go forward regardless. Obviously, it depends on the situation. But as a general matter, as investors, you know, between the first meeting and the wire actually going through, you hope to feel better and better and better about the company with. Um, every additional piece of information that you glean, and when that doesn't happen, um, it's a it's a very diff it's a it's a real challenge. And again, it could hey, be. Give, give an example where that's happened, where you're like, oh shoot, I didn't yeah. I did not expect this. Now I found this. Sure. So um, uh, uh, here here's one example. Um, we were considering investing in a company with 100% uh, uh, technical team. So no 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 business experience, but a very very talented team and a very very intelligent CEO. And uh, what we learned was that the CEO had very little interest in learning business. Certainly had all of the uh, firepower to do it, but just wasn't that interested in it, didn't value it, as many technologists do, right? Many technologists say, look, I'm, I'm the PhD physicist here, and I've invented this incredible contraption, and you, know, you business guys, you know, like, you're, those were the dumb kids in my physics class, right? Who who ended up, you know, going going to get their MBA, and you know that's easy. I'll hire an accountant, right? And and it turns out it's a little trickier than that. Um, and uh, and so um, uh, so when you have, you know, you might have a situation with a technical founder. And it's very often, I mean, very often, it's the deep technical founders who create the multi-billion-dollar companies. Um, uh, so many investors are willing to take those kinds of risks. But in this case, um, it, it was a company where it turned out the, found, the founding CEO just wasn't interested in learning business. And, um, and that created a challenge. I would say two things. Um, one, forecast your numbers so that you hit your numbers during diligence, because you'd be amazed at how many companies were doing diligence over you know, 45 days, 60 days, um, and they don't hit their numbers. And they say, oh, we're going to hit those in, in Q2. Um, so I'd say that's number one. Make them um, more realistic, but aspirational. Um, number two, it, we do do background checks on all of our management teams. So if you have something out there, um, be honest and open with us about it. Um, we'll likely be able to move past it. Um, but it, it, I don't think it's a good thing when there's a big surprise. And that's one example when we were gung-ho about a company, we had a term sheet signed in final diligence, we do the background check with our, our local guy here, and uh, we get the background check, and this guy had numerous you know, red flags on the background check that he hadn't told us about. So I think if he had told us about that in advance, um, it would have been something we may have been able to get past, but the fact that he didn't open up and tell us about it in advance um, was, was a big red flag about him as a person. I mean, for us, it's definitely kind of the two categories we're discussing. One is the relationship part, right? Because you know, Harvard did this interesting study uh, about entrepreneurs and they, they kind of fall into two buckets generally. Those that start their own businesses because they want control and those um, that are focused on achievement. And our job is to partner with the ones that are focused on achievement rather than control. 
and you tend to find that out during the diligence and negotiation process, sort of where people's orientation is. And I'm not, by the way, passing judgment on either one of those preferences, but you have to know yourself, because when you have a financial partner, they expect to be in a relationship with you. And then we have the other category, which are kind of these outliers where something happens in diligence, you find something about an individual's background. We did have one time where we were being shown a deal by another firm that they'd already invested in. This was a follow-up round, and they were very excited about it. It was in the energy space. And um, I got a call from one of the partners saying, you know, we're not, we're not, we're not raising any, any money anymore. And I'm like, did I miss the deal? Was I too slow to respond? And it turned out, and this is a true story. I've shared this with Tian before. Um, he had put the wrong date for a board meeting on his calendar. It was two days before the board meeting. He showed up at their offices in Boulder, and the, the, the CEO, who had built a successful company and sold it to um, Colgate before, had gone to Europe, joined a cult, and came back and started the cult in America, and had taken the prior investor's money literally to make flyers and t-shirts and to you know, spread the gospel of this particular cult. So it was kind of a thing that definitely will kill a deal. <laughs> no, you know. Um, so you're saying it didn't invest? We did not invest, okay. although it was, you know, regret, you know, it went 10x and went public, but I'm, I'm joking about that part. Um, anyway, so you have, like, you, you know, we've, we have earned our cynicism, like, right? you know, things that people have said to us to get our money, you know, we, we've earned it. There's been situations, legitimate situations like that. Hopefully they're outliers, but. Yeah. And I, I would add to it, investors don't like surprises, right? I mean, it, even good surprises, bad surprises, it just, it shows we're not getting enough information now. Are we going to get enough information? Are we going to know about your business later on? Um, which I, I find, um, um, uh, to be true even as you're running a business later on with a board. Um, so here's, here's a challenging one. Um, so research shows that as humans we're unconditionally biased to, to work, uh, invest, play with the people that are like ourselves. And as well research shows that founding boards or founding groups that have um, in management teams with both genders are more successful and yet We've got an under-invested population with, with female, um, female leadership, female-led companies. What have you, how do you work within, uh, knowing half our, our panel here are female, but how do you work within your own biases uh, that come up? Um, and how do you work and promote, uh, what, what's your general thoughts and feelings around this disparity that's happening, especially within tech right now? Maybe Catherine. Let's start with the guys first. All right, let's do that. Uh, I was going to soft it for them. A little soft. <laughs> no warm-up at all, huh? Um, so this is actually, it's funny you asked this question because it came up on a panel recently that I was on in Houston. Um, first of all, you have to be conscious of it, uh, you know, and be aware that, you know, if, you, if we've gone back and we've analyzed our portfolio and we've looked for the correlating factors of our most successful investments, and there are two that are really interesting. The first is having an extraordinary CFO early, right? When we go back and we look at our investments, um, the ones that were really, really terrific and successful and just sort of, you know, it was like running downhill. They were really good. Um, they had early financial support and intelligence and sort of strategic financial intelligence early. And the second is they had a diversified management team both gender, race, et cetera. Um, and so it's that, doing that work and actually seeing it and understanding it and having, the, you know, having it impact you makes you more aware of it. So you know, the last, of, of the last five executives that we've brought into our portfolio at the senior level, four have been women. Yeah, of the last four, five executives that we've brought in, seven have been women. Yeah. Uh, that, that, that would be that would be nice. Um, <laughs> yeah. Well, <laughs> no. I um, I guess I guess I, I'd say that I I think it's a great question and I think it's a really challenging um, problem. Um, I'd say the um, you know we're an a, uh, an angel group. Um, th um, the vast majority of angel groups are comprised principally of men. Um, uh, I will not deny that we are majority men. We are trying very, very hard to um, bring in as many women as possible. So if you are a woman, if you know women who are young, who are interested in angel investing, 
dan at nextgenangels.com. <laughs> um, so, uh, and, I, and I think that, that can help um, ad address um, what I'd hope would be latent biases at most, um, but um, I, I you know, won't deny that that, that can happen. Um, you know, on our own team, we re I'm very pleased to recently bring in a um, senior level woman to, um, uh, to do a phenomenal job in her area and, and also, I think, um, help us make sure that we're investing in women and, um, and, and bring them in. And I, and I do want to hear from Catherine and Julia, though, even as you're making investments, and you're certainly, uh, you've got a unique perspective on, on this position, being a woman um, and being a leader of your organization too, Catherine. How do you, what's, what's your unique perspective to this, both from an investor and from a, an entrepreneur perspective? Well, it's interesting because we just recently just invested with a woman CEO, a New York-based company, and I mean, I must say that the bias worked the other way in that I thought, you know, I'll take, I'll take a risk on this because it is a woman CEO and I'd like to see more. And we also get involved a lot with, um, you know, with women, students that are women that are working either, in, in, plus being an electrical engineer. I mean, there's not a lot of women that are engineers, and there are not a lot of women that were on the trading floor of Deutsche Bank. So it's one of these things where, you know, you see it, but I think that the number one thing that I try to do with counseling women to be able is just uh, is uh, you know even the, even the younger women today that are like my like my daughter's age or it, it basically say just perform. The number one thing you have to do is just perform. Meet your metrics, right? And ultimately, what will happen is is that people don't care whether or not you're a woman, a man, whatever it is. Just whatever you do, set your milestones and deliver, right? And um, and and to kind of get that message out. Plus, I think there's been a lot of progress has been made recently that we're even on this panel talking about this as not something we would have done, <clears throat> excuse me, maybe even five years ago, right? So I think there's the awareness is building, and it, and it continues to to progress. And I think it's I think it's going in a positive direction. Yeah, I'd say this is obviously a very current and hot topic um, uh, across the nation and the world. But um, in an ideal world, it would be 50-50. We'd be in investing maybe even more women than men. But the reality situation is, on both the investor side and on the entrepreneur side, it's it's primarily men. Um, and so we, you know, at, at GrowTech, you know, I think them bringing me on as a, as a female investor was a big step. Um, for most of the firms here in the DC area, it's, it's on the investment team. It is all men. And there is more of a microscope um, on females, I think. When I have brought in two uh, CEOs to pitch, um, and we try to take off that lens and, and, and treat them as an equal um, to our male, the male counterparts, but there is a little bit more of a microscope there. Um, and so that's something I'd like to see go away, and it's, it's a topic that needs to be talked about, and, and you know, there is a lot of progress, um, I think, happening in this space. So uh, we'd love to see more women, the women out there, you know, um, you have my contact information. Feel free to reach out. We, uh, you know, I, I as well, you know, try to mentor. I, I feel like a lot of high school and, and college and MBA students have been reaching, female, have been reaching out to me uh, more recently and, and want to lean in. Um, and I, I, you know, am very, uh, very likely to respond. Um, I try to respond to everybody, male or female, but I'm more likely to respond to a female, so. Hey, Julie, can I ask you a question? Yes, Dan. So um, I'm, step I'm stepping in here, Jim. I, I apologize. So I, I think we're seeing a sort of generational shift where you know uh, people age sort of 20 to 30, 20 to 35. Some some of the best and brightest, what they want to do is be entrepreneurs, right? It, and and yes, it's possible that that you can financially do very well, but it's also um, people care about. Uh, in their work doing what they care about. And you know they have a mission in life, or a couple of missions in life, and starting an organization to fulfill that mission can, be a, can just be a great path. And I think so, you know, younger people, by and large, and especially the best and brightest, want to do that. And I'm, and, um, but I haven't thought about that from a gender perspective. I want, I, and I wonder if, you, if you've seen that, you know, do you think that's a 50-50 thing? Do you think there are more women, more men? Um, yeah, I think, you know, and I've had talks with some people at NBCA um, about forming these groups, and I feel like it, it is important. 
um, from a leadership perspective to make an initiative. I know there's a lot of local women's groups here who are focused either on engineering or um, not so much on the investor side, so that that's something that I would, I would like to you know, pick up and lead and something I've been talking to a few other female investors about in the area about starting um, in, in the coming months, so, uh, so stay tuned. But yeah, I, I definitely think it's, it's something that, that needs to be talked about. Um, I think women do need to be leading these groups um, focused on, on get, getting women uh, more interested and, uh, and I, I also feel like a, a lot of women go out there and think you know, there isn't an opportunity because they see that at least on the investor side I think the latest stat was like 6% of VCs are, are women. Um, so I, I think you know, having women in, in the industry is, is good to, for, for role models at least for these younger women. But yeah, I, I would say generational, um, it, it, it is changing. Um, for my, my business school class, um, you know, a decent amount of, of our class was interested in entrepreneurship and a decent amount of those were women. It's, um, telling the bias can happen based on a woman being biased toward a man too. So we hired a, a, a female-led headhunter, a company uh, that was run by a woman specifically to go find female executives for the next roles, knowing that we had, had other headhunters and they were predominantly bringing us men. And they were, they were male-led and we were, we were concerned about this. It's one of the reasons why uh, our company, I forced ourselves to put all the people of everyone in our company up there, knowing that if we were gonna be mostly white, middle-aged dudes, or younger than middle age, that that was all we were gonna get in the front door. And we, we'd known and, and read these studies as well and, and believed in it. And so it was forcing us to do that. But the interesting thing is when we did that, this woman, that was her charter, brought us all men after a special. So it was very interesting how this bias can, cannot just be male-led, it's sometimes female-led, um, which, is, which is interesting. Um, all of you guys have, have high, high risk. It's easy to look good in the things you don't invest in, because most of them aren't going to be successful. So you go, oh, I, was, I was smart there. Uh, but there's a few times when you, when you go, oh, shoot, I didn't invest, and, and it, it, did, it did pan out. Wow, they, they, did, they did very well. Give some examples. Uh, again, you don't have to give the name of the company, but it'd be great to give some real examples and, and why you didn't invest uh, and what you guys would have done differently knowing, knowing that, oh, wow, they, they, they did crush it. Maybe we'll start this story. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, the true confessions? Yeah, real, okay. real <laughs> If you want to get the company names, I think it'd be better. Well, yeah. Uh, this is going to be a slightly different example, but um, you know we had a chance to invest in LinkedIn at a billion dollar valuation, which you know it's now at twenty, right? So that was a mistake. But at the time, um, it was the first of this kind of social type of firms that had gotten a billion dollar valuation. Now, if you read the Wall Street Journal from earlier in the, the week, there's seventy five companies, private companies valued at a billion dollars or more. So we passed on it primarily because we thought, that's just crazy, right? There's no explanation for it. The business model hadn't been fully flushed out. Um, and the lesson, at least in the consumer space that, that we've observed um, and the way we've subsequently chosen to play it, is that is becoming a winner-take-all market. So if you have a lead and it's a big lead, you end up you know, sort of sucking all the capital in. So if you're going to play it, um, you have to play it big and you have to play with the lead. And if you're starting a company in that space, early traction is e essential. Um, and if anybody offers you money, you take it, right? Those are the lessons from, from that little niche. Of. Yeah, I would say the only companies that I feel like I've really missed out on are those with um, extremely high valuations that we're not willing to, to pay. So we've gotten beat out on a few New York companies recently one that just raised $54 million um, where we weren't comfortable with the valuation. But yeah, I wouldn't say there's anything off the top of my head where you know it wasn't like we didn't invest in the Twitter, small company called Twitter. But um, yeah, there's one in New York in particular that I think is going to have a great outcome um, in the next few years. They've done well. They've raised money from top tier firms. Um, we could have been an investor in their first round, but because of the evaluate, they were valuing eyeballs and uh, and you know, um, Grotech like likes a, a little bit more than that um, to go into the valuation. So um, that's the only reason that we really missed out. Uh, Dan, you could you could draw back the experience even when you were working with John May and <clears throat> you know investments that you've now seen maybe come to full fruition that started as an early idea. Any? 
good examples there? Yeah, so I'll, I'll give I'll give a couple of specific examples, uh, and I'll, I'll I'll name companies, uh, and and w so one fr uh, from uh, my time working for John, uh, in two thousand nine we passed on Optoro. Um, and so it's a local company that a lot of you might know just raised like 50 million from Kleiner Perkins. Um, and I, and we got close, but I, th I think the, the reason we didn't do it was it was 2009 and that was a pretty scary time. Um, and so I think one lesson which we all know and yet still mostly don't follow is the down times are the best times to invest. <laughs> um, but, uh, but it's, you know, even though you might, and that's true whether you're investing in high risk early stage companies or public markets, but, but it is still psychologically challenging. So I think uh, that's sort of one lesson relearned again and again and again. Um, uh, uh, another specific example, um, same lesson here, price, right? Uh, we thought it was, just, it was just too high, but you know what, for the great companies, just shouldn't worry about it too much. And that's a local company called Zoom Data, which uh, recently raised a Series B from Excel. Um, and that was, you know, could have very easily, you know, very easily been in it. The other two examples I'll say are ones where, uh, um, I, so I, I am, at least I'm more concerned about the ones we wanted to invest in but missed, ver rather than the ones we chose not to invest in. Um, and so I'll, I'll give two specific examples. Um, uh, one it, uh, is a local company called TrackMaven, which just raised the second big round from NEA, uh, and we didn't move fast enough. Um, and that was one where yeah, uh, it was a week. It was a matter of a handful of weeks, um, and um, you know the best entrepreneurs move insanely fast, and um, you know it was l like ten days, um, and it was actually hey well, let's get together when we're on the same coast, too late. Um, so that uh, so that that was one, and and another, and there's not this one is not, nothing to be done about, but is um, illustrative of our, our previous conversation about female entrepreneurs is a, lo uh, a local company called Framebridge, um, which has raised some money from NEA and Revolution, um, and and is uh, female led by a fantastic entrepreneur named Susan Tynan. Um, the challenge there is she is a member of Nexion Angels, and uh, and while many of our portfolio companies are led by our own members, um, she said, "I'm not sure I want to be drinking with with my pool of investors." So, um, uh, but but they're doing great, and 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 uh, just a great, ex a wonderful example of uh, what I hope will be an extremely successful female-led company locally. Yeah, I'd agree with the other panelists, and 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 again, it's more a function of some of the good companies and the entrepreneurs. They they run so fast that if you blink your eye and you're not there, and the worst thing is, which I've done before, is you, you, you're you not moving fast enough for the companies that are raising, and then you're focusing on another company, and that company doesn't do quite as well as the one that you missed missed out on, and so that's equally painful. But I agree with other panelists. Have you had any specific brands that you that you did pass on? Nothing is nothing is wonderful as the other panelists with LinkedIn. I was not offered the opportunity to come in at LinkedIn. Yeah, they come in at a billion dollars. So. I added one to Dan's too. Was Canvas, but that's yeah, exactly. <laughs> but, but it, <laughs> yeah, that was but that, that was also two thousand nine, if I remember correctly. It was a tough time. Yeah. It's always a tough thing when you when you're pitching to a group. And I remember pitching to uh, New York Angels. You know, it's one of the larger angel groups. They take two thousand business plans, take it down to two hundred. They personally interview two hundred. They bring three in front to the beautiful top floor of the New York Times building, and uh, it was right after the crash. And gentleman got up, uh, very famous uh, venture capitalist, this guy who created the name venture capitalist, and, and they usually have someone from their, their board will get up and do a pitch on you know, the state of the union of how the, the angel group's doing. And the topic of his, the first slide went up was don't jump out the window. <laughs> it was convincing, yeah, listen, we're gonna hunker down, we've gotten through things, this is pretty bad, this may be the worst, but. We'll, we'll make it. And here's James Quigley. He'd like to ask you for new money. I'm like, yeah. <laughs> uh, all right. Well, uh, this isn't going to go well. Um, what I'd love to do is get some uh, questions from the audience. We've got a few minutes. We're going a little over, but we're told we could do that. Um, anybody, uh, especially entrepreneurs, want to ask some questions? Please. Hi, you got to shout it out. That was no, no mic for the audience. Yeah. No problem. Hi, my name is Josh Marpet. I'm the CEO of Fijoti. Dan, we've talked. And uh, you passed on me. Yeah. <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. I'll give you time. <laughs> but I have to regret it. Uh, my question is actually a comment on a question. The comment is was interesting uh, about the gender conversation. You see, two of you discussing it on idealistic versions or idealistic uh, topics, if you will, or viewpoints, and two discussing it on uh, a more empirical 
uh, de-risking it, and meritocracy. So that was fascinating, I just want to point that out. Uh, the second thing is uh, the question, and that is how do you see seed and early stage investing changing over the last, say, year or two? Because you haven't talked about that, if I didn't miss it. I can comment on that. Dan okay. But I think what you're seeing a lot is, is that you're seeing, well, first of all, you're seeing a bifurcation in venture, and Julie can probably mention this a lot more than I can, that you're seeing the number of funds that have raised money less than $50 million has moved from 55 to 111 in a three-year in a three year time frame, right? And, and in between that, you're also seeing fewer companies in the Series A, fewer vent, venture firms in the Series A, and you're seeing a lot that are raising money from the 650 million and over range, right? So what happens? What happens then is, is that you have Series A, and then you have, because the companies with a product in the market, then you have series, then you have what they call seed post seed, right? So we're seeing a lot of that as well, and the, the 50 million, rev and, the, rev and, the, and the, the funds that are in the 50 million range are doing that. Then they hit a wall, right? And that's what they call, <coughs> pardon me, the series A crunch. So more and more companies can be, actually be funded on the seed side, but then when it comes to going to the next level, it's harder just because there's a dearth of Series A companies. And in addition, the um, actual definition of seed and Series A and Series B has changed and has moved up the spectrum. So I don't feel it. Yeah, I, th I think that's exactly right. So I'll make one, uh, uh, one comment sort of separate from that and then, and then reflect on what Catherine said. So uh, one, of th one of the trends that I think is very encouraging, I would say this is sort of last two to three years, is um, a, uh, a move towards technology-enabled services um, and physical goods in addition to more traditional er so areas like uh, software, internet, medical device, you know, uh, biotech, energy, right? So, um, so now, now company like a company like Uber or a company like Airbnb or um, uh, or drone companies, right? Um, there, you know, lot there are lots of logistics companies out there that um, that where that you have brilliant entrepreneurs attacking industries um, uh, that have been stale for decades, um, where. Um, if maybe five years ago or ten years ago, uh, investors would say, "Oh, that's that real world stuff is too hard, right? Or too capital intensive? Or you know, I don't like hardware because of inventory costs." And all of those are good points. Um, and yet, you have a forty billion dollar company in Uber. So, uh, so I think I think that's a I, I like that trend. It expands the scope of the possibility for innovation. Um, so, so I'm I'm hopeful about that generally. And that's not just seed stage. That's that's you know, all the way through the funding ecosystem and, and food chain. Um, with regard to Catherine's point, she's absolutely right. There's been um, a, a significant spike in sort of seed stage funds um, over the last uh, year or two. Um, I would say that I would say that they are concentrated in New York and the Bay Area. So um, and and so as a result, you see insanely competitive and and in my mind over very overpriced um, startups in those two ecosystems at least us I'd say the same thing about Shanghai and some other places but um, but I think I think it seed stage investing remains a, a fairly localized phenomenon um, investors are unlikely to hop on a plane for a board meeting to protect a hundred thousand dollars they will for 10 million um, so so your most early stage companies are going to raise locally and if you're not in New York or the, or, or the Bay Area then um, then it's still tough to raise a million bucks, um, or uh, and and for the, for the most part, companies will pe uh, startups will piece it together from three, five, ten, twenty, fifty different sources. Um, so uh, it's one of the you know it's a challenge for entrepreneurs. It's one of the things Next Gen Angels is trying to address by being doing a million dollar, two million dollar um, rounds ourselves. Um, so, uh, but I think I think there are outside of those two ecosystems in Boston to uh, to a secondary degree. Um, most companies, if you want to graduate from you know th uh, three people in a garage to you know a team of ten and the ability to you know hop on a plane when you need to and a little you know a little bit of working capital, you need a million bucks. You need two million dollars, and there just aren't a lot of people um, in that niche, despite this rise, which Catherine very rightly points out in in these seed stage funds. Okay, let's get some other questions. Uh, how you guys doing? Uh, Leonard Adams, attorney by trade, serial entrepreneur. My question is uh, actually to the entire panel. The introduction, uh, that's something that we continue to hear, how imperative it is. I was hoping that uh, maybe each of you can kind of chime in on that. Uh, uh, kind of a follow-up. 
have you guys actually, uh, I guess, taken meetings and invested in folks uh, who may have not come from a, a, a high uh, referencing uh, uh, individual? And how did you guys handle that? I'm a big fan of the warm introduction um, with LinkedIn and Facebook and social media. I'd find it very hard that you wouldn't be able to get at least a second connection to somebody in one of these um, firms that you want to be talking to. So we do take cold emails um, from entrepreneurs and I would say they get probably um, not as prioritized as the ones that come in with a warm introduction and that could even be you know a friend from undergrad whose friend is your friend you know even if it comes in through some type of a connection it, there's a very high likelihood that that we are going to respond so um, and that's how how I um, approach companies um, if there's a company I read about I want an introduction and you know my best friends mother's brothers cousin somehow knows them I that's that's the route I go because I'd much rather go in that way than through a cold email um, or, or a cold call I'll add that I don't think we've raised, I have to think about this, but I don't think we've raised money from any investor um, where we didn't get introduced by someone who knew them first. It is really hard to go against, to go completely cold. And I'd say, I wouldn't be too worried about your network because if you're, you're gung-ho and you're, uh, you're, gonna, you're gonna work it hard, you'll find out the people they know uh, who maybe have a less vested interest in those things, get to know those people and get those people to bring you in too. But cold calling into an investment group is, I, I mean, they'll give their own story, but it's near impossible. Yeah, especially here in DC, it's such a small investor community that if you come to me and it's not a great fit for us, you know, we'll shoot it over to Todd or to Dan or Catherine. Um, and you just have to make that ask. And, you know, more than half the time, I'll, I'm happy to make that introduction. The best people to introduce are current investors. Matter of fact, we met Catherine through someone who was already invested in us and then was friends with Catherine and then, um, and, and those are obviously the, the, the best ways to go. And they don't have to be big investments too. We've had people who invested $5,000 in our early days who brought in other people, but because they personally put you know money in, it, you know, it can lead up to much larger. Did you have a, did you wanna? No, I mean, the, my, res my response would be consistent and the truth is um, when we look at our deal flow and the deals we've actually done, they've all been referred in, every single one of them. So you all are very lucky. You're in this room, you know Tien. I mean, that's, you know, if I get a call from Tien, it's very different than if I, if I get it from a stranger. And so it makes a big difference. And the, I would emphasize the networking piece of it, going to um, a bunch of entrepreneurial events, because we also get referrals from other entrepreneurs. So this is somebody, you know, we, we don't compete with them, we know them, et cetera. And, and so if one of our portfolio company CEOs or, or executives introduces a deal to us, we pay very close attention to it. I think we've... Actually, can I, can, I, can, I, can I make one quick comment on that? Comment on that? So, um, so there's, the, uh, I think, you know, Todd and Julia are abs like absolutely right, right? You have to have the warm introduction. But that's, that's in my mind, just that's the first step, the element of the introduction. There's another equally important element on top of that, which is um, what is being said in that introduction, right? So ve very often, you know, it, like, there's a signal that the individual is, is sending. It's, hey, I, I met these guys and they seem interesting, okay? That's one level of priority, right? <laughs> Another level of priority is, um, you know, uh, hey Dan, I'm investing in this round. Um, you should seriously take a look or, um, you know, the CEO was my former VP of engineering and was the rock star of our team. This is insanely interesting, right? And I'm an, I'm, I'm an advisor, right? Um, versus, um, hey, you know, here's a PowerPoint presentation, right? And, um, and so one of the sort of dirty secrets of our field is that um, meeting entrepreneurs for the first time is a small piece of how we of how we spend our time right so we are uh, work with our portfolio companies there are, there are active deals that we're working on there's managing our own business right the, the i mean we have, there's nuts and bolts of actually any kind of operation there are limited partners or our, the people who are actually providing the capital that we're dealing with um there's you know um they're on and on and on so um, so there's a, frankly, a vicious prioritization of which companies that you're going to meet with um, for, for initial meeting and which companies are a, I'm doing this as a favor to somebody versus, okay, I'm going to come to this meeting prepared, serious, like, let, um, you know, and, and it's what is said in that, in that email introduction that is absolutely critical. 
Um, uh, we, can, we can do one more question. Great. Jeff. Uh, yeah, Peter, Justin, I'm always curious at an early stage how you address that voodoo economics called valuation. Julia, do you want to? Here we go. Um, yeah, it, it's really hard. I mean, it's what the market will bear, right? So um, we liked, I, I like to think that we're pretty, um, I wouldn't say calculated how we do our evaluations. It's more you're coming in as, as a Series A, you have less than a million in revenue. That's going to grow to six million next year and then 12 million the year after, of course. But um, for us, it's you know what the market will bear and what's fair to the entrepreneur because you, you both want to be walking away with that was a fair deal. Um, if the entrepreneur is very, very um, confident, we will sometimes put in a mechanism so that there's downside protection for us if you don't hit your numbers. So sometimes entrepreneur will come in and say, you know, we're going to do 10 million next year. We say that's great. If you hit eight of that or seven of that, we're happy to pay your valuation. But if not, you know, we'll put in a mechanism where it'll it'll ratchet back. Um, so yeah, so we're happy to to play to the entrepreneur's confidence and uh, and. Their, um, their confidence in the business, but um, you know we also need to know that we can make a venture return on it. The only thing I would sort of add to that, because we have a very similar process, is one part of the analysis we do is really trying to understand what the future capital needs through multiple cycles of capital raising are going to be. And we have target uh, ownerships, you know, you know, ranges that we like to hit between 10 and 20% by the time it's sort of all done. And we'll do an analysis starting at the end and working backwards. Well, so you know, if we raise five million this round, and we do these things, and then we're going to need fifteen in the next round, we'll literally work our way backwards. And so part of it is, you know, when you're having this discussion with a prospective investor who thinks the way we do, which is over multiple rounds, you have to think about what your capital needs are going to be, what the likely dilution is going to be, and and where you want to end up as well. And somehow you have to find a place in the middle. I, I would add one thing as a, as an entrepreneur. So. I would reframe it a little bit differently in, 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 in everybody's head um, as an entrepreneur, because I think investors mo mostly have this right, is that it is in our best interest and an investor's best interest to actually find middle ground. You think as an entrepreneur, I'm, uh, I'm worth 10, 20 million, and, and uh, the investor's trying to get you down to a half a million. Actually, if you look at it properly, it's best for you and for them to find the right space. And here's the reason why. Um, and, I, and I've met entrepreneurs who pummeled, crashed their company because they sold to friends and family for $20 million early on. And then when they actually had to go raise money, and they had to have a real valuation, and they had to go back to those same people that you know, are most dear to them, or, or early investors who they you know, promised their firstborn and said, by the way, we're, we're doing okay, but I need more money, but I'm worth half as much. Those are really tough conversations. So I find the best investors who, who are more schooled in this will help. They don't want to, they don't want to, certainly they want to make money, but they need to get it at a good valuation too. Uh, they want you to be happy and, and they want the management team to have a certain uh, amount of equity to keep you motivated. Um, so uh, it, it isn't, the best situations aren't this bipolar, you know, and we got to fight for the middle. Um, that's been my opinion. The, the best situations have worked that way, but Dan, did you look like you were going to say something? Sure. So um, I, I'd say two quick things. Um, uh, the, uh, the first is um, on venture mat. So there's there's uh, the way people talk about it, and then the sort of theory behind it. And it's similar to like investing in public equities or or anything else. So in public e public equities, people talk about PE ratios or multiples of very multiple on EBITDA, multiple on revenue, and so forth. No, that's those are shorthands. Right, they're shorthands for a discounted cash flow analysis or a net, or a net present value analysis. Right, and but but you you sort of no, you you sort of learn that that like the theory of it and the dis, and the discounted cash flow analysis once, and then you sort of use these shorthands because everyone sort of know, knows what it is. Similar in our world, right, where it is, it is it, it's the analysis is actually it's related to to what Todd just said, which is all right. We think we think what's the likely exit going to be, 
And then what are the uh, intermediary rounds of capital and the other dilution related to expanding the option pool and the cost of paying the freaking bankers and the lawyers upon exit and so forth. And so we sort of back into what is the in, this initial investment or this early investment going to look like? What's the return that we can actually expect given the, given the future dilution? And what's the, uh, what's the risk level of the business and therefore what's the return that we need, right? So that's the theory behind it, but you don't actually do that math on every deal because you know that, you know, oh, I've, I've already done, I've done it three times in my life or six times in my life. I don't need to do it the 30th time. I just apply the shorthand, right? Which just like in public markets, you apply the shorthand of a PE ratio. Here we'll say, okay, it's a SaaS recurring revenue business. It's at $2 million. In re you know, you can sort of, apl you apply a multiple, right? And that, that helps you get the sort of the, um, you know, what, you know, what is, what is fair. Yeah, it's a it's it's a rule of, it's a rule of thumb, and so and oh and, and um, so and some look sometimes uh, you know your valuation might be higher than the rule of thumb for good reason. Sometimes it might be lower than the rule of thumb for good reason. The rule of thumb though is it, I would say sort of eighty percent of the time it's probably about right, and it's better than something that entrepreneurs often come in with, which is I read on TechCrunch about this company that um, that is similar to mine. And they got X valuation, so that's what I think I'm worth. And you know, we, you know, very often the response is one of three things: um, it's okay, but they came out of Y Combinator, and every Y Combinator company is overpriced. Um, it's um, uh, you know, um, it's oh yeah, yeah. But did you know that it was the former CTO of HP who's you know the leader, and and you seem great, but maybe you're not the former CTO of, of HP. Um, you know, uh, so so or it's oh yeah maybe they're written about because that's a crazy valuation. <laughs> so um, <laughs> so um, uh, you know it's perfectly fine for an entrepreneur to to come with the venture beat article with the, this valuation comp, but you know don't necessarily take that too seriously. I think there's also I agree with everything the panelists have said, and, and Dan I think is going to mentioning that it's sometimes it's an art as well as a fine science, right? I mean that's that's one of the answers. But there's a couple of good references I think for some of the beginning entrepreneurs that. I've worked with before, like Brad Feld has a really good book out that you may want to, for, for those that are, have never raised capital before, may want to read. I think Ask a VC. Fred Wilson does a really good job um, for, for new entrepreneurs and kind of defining what, what the art versus the science is. And so there's some, there's some really good um, reference material to kind of get started on. This could be helpful. On that note, let's give it up for this awesome panel. Um,